Assalamualaikum. Taja Hao. Vornikum. Sat Sri Akal. And welcome back to Yang Chao Session. <laughs> Good to be back. <laughs> Good to be back. And today, once again, we are very privileged to be able to, to host Sykes are they all over again? It's yep. been a in a new years. location. In a new location, of looks course. Looks a lot more relaxed back then. It was a table. Mm, looks yes. like you guys were grilling me in a video. Oh, yeah. you know, we did try. We yeah. did try. <laughs> we tried. <laughs> but personally, do you feel like you like the relaxed setting more? I, I obviously relaxed setting. Really? More. Uh? Yeah. Oh, I like the table one. Ah, all right, this that is one because you were the one grilling. <laughs> no, I'm grilling you. <laughs> no, bro, but the table one, right? Feels as if it's more intimate. You don't think so? Like How this one, is this not intimate, bro? This one feels like a talk show. <laughs> that one feels like a conversation. Don't you think when you have, okay, let's say like you go mama yeah. or you go like wherever, right? You makan. It's always facing the other person. And that's when deep conversation really happens. But if you're doing this and okay, it's front fair of point, fair point. You know what I'm saying? It is okay. You just got married. You, you, you are right on this. La. We give it to you. We okay. give it. All right. I appreciate you know, it. You, you, you open John's Pandora box. You know, when we talk about this, right? This one, he's like, no, bro. We need the table, bro. <laughs> it's also because yeah. the, the, it's modeled after the Joe Rogan experience. You know, oh, it's like it's facing okay. each other. Yeah. That's true. Hey, but no, but you okay. have to listen to the, to, to Syed's point. Yeah. He's on the receiving end of it, you know. Yeah. I guess. Oh. Right? Yeah. For us, it's day on day, same thing, right? Yeah, it's a fair point. Are we being interviewed now, right now? You just <laughs> comment below and let us know what you think, like, I guess. All right, but once again, it's great to see him all again. Once again, if you guys were very active in social media, you have always seen him in uh, Instagram, especially every time, I think twice a day, I always see his site Saturday is now live. You know, yes. problem was going to two days ago, he was I'm live as well. trying my best to do as trying very often nice, as possible. You know, yeah. uplifting and keeping words to his muda because <laughs> We are very active in social media as I, well. Yeah. But I have to say, I'm quite sad, right? That we are not doing this podcast in MOA. Hey, yeah, hey. you guys are supposed to come down to MOA. Correct. Exactly. Correct. That was the we should do a podcast while eating mm. otak-otak MOA, yeah, while eating asam, asam pedas. pedas. Uh, then, then you get the best relaxed setting. Okay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, not just looking at each other, looking at the fish. <laughs> then what <laughs> do we do? <laughs> Apa kita buat is the next time we will find a, a place in MOA. Yeah. And when you are in MOA as well, yeah. Then we cast out team sana lah. I can yeah. definitely host one, no problem. Already know where. Already know where. Oh, yeah. Already know where. You oh. want to do inside Kebun Durian can. You want to do next to the beach can. You want to do- oh, We need power, bro. We, we need electric wiring. generator. We, you, we oh, will- Oh yeah, I forgot We will solve <laughs> the- We will solve the- was, power generator issue. You know? Okay. I was looking at all the places in Moa actually. Yeah. Like where to go, where to go. I was around to contact, but in the end, you was like, I think we do it in KL. I'm like, okay lah. Cause your schedule is here, right? I asked Ain or Jack, right? Like, we yeah. can do it in Moa. It is okay. Di mana ada kemahuan, di suruh jalan. Wah, cik. Oh, okay lah. La. Okay. Let's go to the first question. <laughs> actually, uh, I want to start. If uh if you don't mind, right? Yeah. I was looking through your Instagram, bro. Actually, yeah. I didn't really look. You I think my my wife was looking through it last night. Oh, you know, I feel a little more scared, lah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. like, oh yeah, Sai is on a roll, man. This guy, four podcasts in a day. Oh. That's wow. damn hardcore, man. Yesterday. You followed. Not bad, not bad. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, and then um, today is how many? Yeah, I, I today is like how many? Yeah, you're now finished. Three. This is the second. Tonight got one more. Oh, three. three. Wow. Day three. This is intense. You know, it's okay because it's, and a lot, all the themes are very different. Huh? Yeah. You know, laid back, we're going to talk about mental health, we're going to talk about women empowerment, and mm. they got a little bit of politics in between. Women empowerment. But, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why is that? It's not part of the email, bro. It's part of the email. She, goes, she mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. isn't it tiring, bro? It's like, Hardcore, well, like, right? The point which you see that you're talking to friends, you don't see it tiring. Like. If you see it as a job, definitely tiring. <laughs> like. mm. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I, I, I just want to check one thing. I mean, uh. I, I can't mention which podcast it was yesterday. Yeah. You guys have your video on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, why? Eh? Yesterday we recorded for two hours and then- and uh, They didn't click on. Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether it was, they didn't click on or not, but yeah. It's on. on, on. It's, it's red on. color right okay, there. Okay. It's red, it's oh my God, that's a bicep stuff. Whoever you are, uh, okay, don't lie. Don't blame. <laughs> okay. That was the first time in a very long time, but I just want to ensure that I think it's on point. Yeah, hey, I think life <laughs> well, happens. Uh, uh, but the it, audio, yeah, yeah. it happens, uh, you know? It happens. It always man. happens, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think, I don't know what topics per se, because you were saying how it's very fragmented in a sense. Yeah, but yeah up to you, like, ask anything, man. Ask anything. Uh. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, can, bro. Can. I, okay, wait, wait, before I start the question, uh, so, sorry, sorry, sure, sorry. Uh, sure, uh, I, was, I was listening to the Tiber podcast. Okay. Is that how you pronounce it? Tiber, yeah. Tiber, right? Yeah. Bro, it's so fascinating. I listened to it twice. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, actually, yesterday and this morning. And, okay, to be fair, my Malay is. Not the best. It's, eff it's effing trash lah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's like, I understand like maybe 70% I was okay, talking. Okay lah. That's pretty decent. No? That's pretty yeah. decent. Yeah, okay. 70 is B plus, you know. <laughs> is it B plus or B, mi B plus? B plus. 75 is A minus. 75 is A minus. It depends yeah, yeah. on the bell curve that year as well, right? <laughs> Because we always change our world. It's such a Malaysian yeah. thing. We'll go look at bell curve, you know what yeah, yeah, yeah. MJ is always like, you should look at the bell curve first, then you see whether it's proper B or not. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I was listening to him, I was like, so fascinated. And he was asking some personal questions also, you yep. know. Yep. But you also wiggle away around. Like. 
<laughs> so yesterday, I mean, in almost all podcasts, mm. I think can 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 we ask anything? I say ask anything. Mm. Okay, but then they ask me, so what's your what's the toughest question? I said anything to do with my relationship is the toughest. Ah. Yeah. Hey, you know, you just got married. You know, these kind of things are you cannot say. That's true. Right? I mean, like uh, yeah. So anything about politics, boy, I'll deal with it. I ask about relationship, I become like a kitten. Uh. Yeah, I was gonna ask like just I don't know what you can say. You can just say no sure. comment. Sure. Uh, all right. If you have a partner or you don't want to say whether you have a partner or whatever, okay, right? Okay, okay. okay. Hypothetically, okay. Yeah. In that, hypothetically, in that hypothetical situation <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. in which you have that partner, right? Yeah. Is that person just very private and she's like, I don't want to do anything with your public life? Not that simple. Uh. Is it? It's so. not that simple. Often they may be overlaps. Okay. Um, especially in terms of friends, family, uh, mm. programs, occasionally. So it's not that simple. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got you. I got Ideally, you. they should be like separation but uh it's much easier said than done yeah there is yeah. a quote you mentioned in that podcast or the or some other podcast mm. you were saying how in government it's not black and white it's a lot of gray correct so i uh, suppose that is also practiced there especially like, I guess. when it comes to relationship stuff and and when you're also in politics yeah because mm. your yeah. private life is like no longer private lah it is man it's yeah. quite tough man yeah. well now you know how Sp- uh, spider-man peter parker feels <laughs> <laughs> right i guess it's the reverse bro right right where's the reverse and it's the fame bro right okay. it's literally the reverse okay. it's right it is the exact reverse exactly. you know yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. can keep privacy can wear the mask what mask can i wear oh bro i have, a, I have this great idea <laughs> yeah i don't know whether you're up for it i'm not for it why but if you do lasik and you wear glasses apparently no one can tell Huh? So, so if, if you do can. LASIK, if oh, yeah, it's yeah. that Clark Kent effect. Okay. You know, if you do LASIK and you just stop wearing glasses, people okay. identify your, your face as this. And then when you wear glasses, people won't identify you. Really. Then you're not supposed to identify me. Last time I went on your show, you I wasn't wearing, wearing glasses. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so now, now, but now be- we know, la, you tell us you're meeting there, <laughs> then Takan, I like, don't know, right? But if I walk by you, maybe I wouldn't know. So, <laughs> right. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, Clark Kent, Clark Kent. Clark Kent, Clark Kent, Clark Kent. Also, a uh, quick shout out to MJ from Viral Podcast, Woo. right? He's the one that's uh, letting us use his studio us. for today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I also want to it's highlight how there was a restaurant named Susano also who offered yeah. to do oh, the wow. podcast there. Wow, can makan there. The one is not exactly Tapi... halal, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> it was, it's a very nice place. Can makan lah, can, yeah. You can go around it lah. Yeah, but yeah. do you watch Naruto? Yeah, I do. It's a Naruto themed bar. Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's the best. Seriously? Stuff behind there. It's the best. There is none oh, like it. Wow. You yeah. have the Sharingan, Rinning Gun. Gun. Where is this at? It's OUG. OUG. Where, where, our nearby oh, wow. studio, the previous studio. I oh, feel it's really fun. I feel like when you promote Moi, mm. I see myself promoting OUG as much as you promote Moi. <laughs> but except OUG, I feel the it's quite overrated when it comes to food and the parking is quite bad. <laughs> yeah. So I will I will say negative things about OUG la. I okay. know. <laughs> Just when it was about to look over oh, Bagus, and then But it's got Naruto bar though, so that supersedes everything. Oh my God. Yeah, that. Yeah, okay, man. great. But now what we go do we yeah. go to the first question. Yeah. No I mean not question, our first thing we want to know, right? Okay. Yeah. So like if I'm not mistaken, next week we do have an election coming up, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like for me, typically for individuals or Malaysians out there who don't really follow politics much, but want to know some sort of stuff going on in Malaysia. Yeah. What is the manifesto, right? Mm. Of your party? So actually tomorrow we are announcing it. Oh, we are literally shit. announcing so this, it tomorrow. But don't worry, we are posting our Post-its. video the day yeah, after. It's so okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean uh, <laughs> but but just to show why it is important to talk about ideas because when you don't talk about ideas, you don't talk about principles, you don't talk about values, Mm -hmm. then in the end, politics get overwhelmed with issues of race and religion Mm -hmm. because when there's a lack of direction and there's a vacuum, that vacuum will end up being filled by something which is very easy, which is emotions and sentiments tied to race and religion. And that's why I think for Muda, we're going to focus a lot more on policies. So tomorrow you'll hear our policies which we want to implement in the six states, whether it's about having the third vote, which is local municipal elections, Mm -hmm. whether it's about compelling everyone uh, in positions of power to declare their assets, whether it's about creating an independent body to select anyone and everyone who wants to be appointed on GLCs, state GLCs, to become even Ahli Majlis and Kotu Kampung, because today it's all based on on, on political cronism and -hmm. political connections. And more than that, it's about having, investing a lot more in public transportation, moving up the hierarchy of renewable energy and above and beyond that, also to ensure that we reform and overhaul our education system, moving away from the typical race-based system to one which merges merit and needs-based. So it's very long. It's quite a lot. However, I think the ultimate goal is to build a system of politics which is not reliant on personalities or hyper-partisanship. Just imagine a world in which Imagine the most hated person you have in mind 
that person becomes prime minister, oh, yeah. wow. but our all. country, <laughs> but our country will still be <laughs> in the right footing, right direction because it's not based on that individual, but it's based on right. institutions mm. which supersede personalities. So that's the summary of it. Yeah. I, I didn't I didn't hear you touch on the economy. What's what's Muda's plan on the economy? Gee, so, right. well, that's, that's, that's a very good question. First thing first, we need to acknowledge this uh, localized state elections. So state elections, different states have different interests, have different expertise. I think if we look at Slangov, um, for example, currently since the past 10 years, it has always been the economic engine of Malaysia. About a quarter of our GDP per capita, our nation's GDP per capita originates in Slango. However, I think when it comes to the development of renewable energy in Slango, I think we're still far, far behind. Mm. That's yeah. where you see a lot of the multi-billion dollar investments, where it's on data centers and RE actually being focused in Johor, which to me is a wasted opportunity because two key reasons. One, I think Slango as a growth hub, as a lot of smart manufacturing enters, it must be powered by RE. If not, smart manufacturing data, data centers will not want to enter because the precondition set is RE. Two, Slango could also be the state to export RE to states like Penang, which already has major semiconductor hubs there, right? Smart, uh, smart manufacturing, smart factories, etc., which again requires that. So I think one is Slango must transition from a carbon intensive economy to one which is um, reliant or powered by renewable energy. That's one part of it. Secondarily behind it, I think Slango must compete with Johor and Penang to be the smart manufacturing hub because currently, all the major semiconductor industries in the world, actually parts of it are being based in Penang, right? oh. which I think is great. However, I think the expansion plan becomes very, very tough because yes. of the lack of land, etc. I think Slango is uniquely placed for that. And I think we should actually captivate that and above and beyond it, provide unique matching grants to bring in major institutions in Slango powered by RE and a non-bureaucratic system. That's two. Three, I want to talk about entertainment. Uh, entertainment oh. tourism, right? Oh, because yeah. Marilla. 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 This, I've seen so many videos okay, on okay. you. No, no, but, but this one is close. Yeah. It's really close to my heart, right? Yeah. Why didn't Taylor Swift, Coldplay, and many others it's come to tape. Malaysia? It's red tape. Red tape is one, but it's not just red tape, right? So if you think about it, PASS has always protested like since yeah. 20 years. Like, I mean, but people still come. But today, Malaysia is overlooked. Yeah. Malaysia has one of the most punitive entertainment tax mm. in the region. It's at 25%. That's not controlled by federal, it's controlled by state. Oh, okay. I think one, to make Slango the entertainment hub. To reduce that. One is to reduce and where we can give exemptions, give exemptions. Because the multiplier you get is so much more. I think there's so much articles and mathematicians and analysts showing that $1 you put in into entertainment tourism, you get $5 to $10 back. That's one. Secondarily is the advantage of Slango, we already have good infrastructure. Stadiums. Big and, stadiums, yeah, right? Yeah. Singapore, bigger stadium, 50,000. Slango now, when you want to remodel, it may go up to 60, 70,000, yeah. right? So we already have good infrastructure, good connectivity, now with exemption of entertainment tax. And above and beyond that, a non-bureaucratic process, I think we can become the entertainment hub. But why do you think they, they, the tax is so high and why do you think they make it so difficult? Because if it is, it is what it is, right? But there has to be a reason why it is that way. It, it's almost as if it's created to deter Entertainment. Do, uh, don't you feel? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very weird, right? Back then, 1980s, 1990s, they picked us first yeah. because we were very flexible in our taxation system. We gave a lot of exemptions, etc. Yeah. Singapore then was very punitive and today it's opposite. It's a, it's a reverse. Reverse. Singapore, and, and mind you, I don't think we should only just wait for people to consider performing in Southeast Asia. Singapore, right. in terms of their entertainment, tourism, uh, marketing, it's very incentivized. even during times of COVID, yeah. That's when they went to actively pursue and sign exclusive deals. That's why, for an example, Taylor Swift picked Singapore. The exclusive six days. Exclusively six yep, days. Yep, yep. That's 300,000 tickets sold. It means a minimum of at least half, 150,000 from abroad coming in, buying flight tickets, hotels, yep. F&B, shopping, Transportation, name it. I everything. mean, everything. And the trickle down is amazing. I mean, they also have to convert their local currencies to Singapore dollars to spend there. So, I mean, one, the other part is obviously on entertainment, uh, tourism, which I think we need to also look at. So, it's a, it's a multiple, I mean, so oh, I'm, Subang in particular is also uh, um, an aeronautical hub, especially yeah. for MRO. I think we should capitalize on that. We should really work together with federal government to ensure that uh, Subang Airport can be upgraded, not just taken over by private sector, which has been proposed before. Yeah. But what I did propose as an alternative, I remember in 2021, when a private group wanted to 
privatized Subang Airport, which I disagreed. I think Malaysian airports look at it, elaborate, have the expansion plan, focus on, on making Subang Airport not just you know, an airport, but yeah. also a huge MRO hub around it, not just servicing clients here in Malaysia, but regionally. I'm going to sound like I'm not like, but what does MRO stand MRO, for? Is it? In a way, it's for maintenance. Uh, uh, so maintenance of aircrafts, uh, at the same time, upgrading. I see. Uh, so it's not, so all aircrafts have thousands of parts. Yeah. Malaysia will not be able, for example, Malaysia cannot compete with the Airbus of the world mm-hmm. or Boeings of the world. But what we can do is to get Airbus and Boeing to, product, uh, to produce specific parts I see. in Malaysia for export. For an example, many of us may not know, but a lot of the parts in our Apple phone uh, are actually produced in Penang. Oh, sure. And then exported abroad. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. Uh, so wow. Malaysia, I mean, th- this is another part which a lot of Malaysians don't know. I mean, we always think that our economy is largely powered by Petronas and oil and gas. Yeah. To some extent, it's true. But the bigger sector is actually e e So again, we don't, we don't come up with like a whole iPhone. But part of it. But a lot of the parts of it, semi, uh, our, our semiconductor industry is huge. It contributes almost a quarter of our export. The, 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 the value of our it's export. It's quite insane, a quarter. Yeah, exactly. I think it's 22% last I checked. Damn. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Malaysia actually is quite a decent country. We are, we are the, in a way, the supply chain of the world. And Malaysia should always be the supply chain. But where I feel very passionate about, we should not be the low end supply chain. Yeah. We need to climb up that supply chain so that in the end, uh, we don't just uh, extract raw minerals and export. We extract, we, we produce, produce, we get the parts and then we export. Do not lose that competitive edge. I think you mentioned before on the previous podcast, MOA is like the third biggest furniture exporter in Asia yep. or something Correct. like that as well. It's yep. crazy, man. We export MOA, the small town MOA, yeah. export 11 billion ringgit of furniture per annum. It's crazy. It is unbelievable. I mean, most likely the furniture we're sitting on now is also for MOA. Yeah. When I was studying in NUS <laughs> during lockdown, they placed me in uh, one of the best hotels, I think it was Shangri-La. When I met up with the hotel manager, <laughs> I, I know this chair. I mean, I've seen it more. <laughs> and then initially the manager said, no, 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 no. It's local me. It's from home. Eh? And then uh, you flip it. Check, <laughs> and then, oh, it's in more. I said, it's okay. La, manager Singapore, local me. Same. <laughs> you know, I was joking. It's joking. It's so very nice to you say. It's just very nice to you say. But I didn't realize this. And I think when you said it, I was like, oh, interesting. So I decided to make a detour because I was working in Johor for yeah. like that week. I told my colleague, I was like, I want to make a detour to more. Yeah. Just to try the Asam Pedas and yep. see whether there's a lot of furniture factories. Yep. It's true enough. I was like, well, damn. It's yeah, a lot. A lot. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah. But, but, left and right. but the problem uh, in more, if I may share, and this is also a problem in a lot manufacturing sectors mm-hmm. in Malaysia, is that we're, we're still the OEM of the world. Yep. So we produce it, but we don't know how to put it market, in, it. Uh, market it, interior design, have our own brand. So that's yeah. an issue. So in the end, we'll always be subjected to that low-end supply chain and almost largely reliant on foreign workers. Um, mm. I have nothing against foreign workers. It's just that we need to start moving into automation. Yeah. But for that to happen, and this is why I feel very passionate as well, something you we should do in Slango, the matching grants should be grants based on companies, manufacturing, SMEs, who are willing to automate. Yeah. Let's say you it's put, in, incentive, right? you put yeah. in $5,000, government put in another $5,000, but as a consequence, instead of needing to hire and foreign workers, you can have, you can hire three locals who are paid highly. I think that's mm. a very good transition as you move up the socioeconomic ladder. Cool. Actually, but you know, if you want to go into the tax and everything, so I remember I was talking to Andrew about this. He was saying, I don't know what the statistic is. Like how many people, how many percent of Malaysia only pays tax, right? right. 25%. Uh, the important statistic is 85% of income tax is paid by the T20. That's true. Yeah. That's very true. But at the same time, Oh. Almost the exact same amount percentage of petrol subsidies also go to the T20. Yeah. Ah. And oh. uh, I can name so many things. <laughs> Almost all the monopolies in Malaysia, uh, whether it's concessions, go to the same group, many, many other things. So that's why in Malaysia, I mean, I have nothing against the T20. If anything, when they make profits, it also means we tax them and we yeah. get the money. However, <clears throat> above and beyond it, we need to create a system of equal opportunities, not equal outcomes, yeah. uh, regardless of race and religion. So, that means uh, oh. restructuring our economic system. That's actually a great segue to the, the next question into right. education. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. Oh, that's why I feel more special. Anak Cikgu, Masih. Let's go lah. <laughs> okay. Anak Cikgu. So, Anak Cikgu, yeah? You know, mm. the, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to the Malaysian education system. And yep. I think you mentioned this plenty of times as well on previous podcasts, how like a lot of ministers and a lot of very wealthy people always talk about how like the education system is like great, it's great, it's great. Yeah. But in the end, they send their kids to international school, they send oh, their kids yeah. to all that. And you get very fired up, right? I get very fired up. Yeah, but 
if I may finish, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have this internal discussion, especially with Andrew a lot, yeah. about how vernacular schools could be the cost of all this also. Because Chinese schools are funded very, very much. Like mm. if you look at how the PIBG is, is structured, right? Okay. It's such that if, for example, right, there's a Chinese school, they have a basketball court. Yeah. And then they start to produce one or two decent basketball players. And then the, the, the parents are like, oh, we should really invest. And then it just pump, 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 pump. Yeah. But I don't think people see that it creates a divide of sorts, mm. you know? Because a lot of China, uh, granted, there are a lot of Indians and Malays that do go yeah. to Chinese schools nowadays. But do you feel like it creates a divide? Because I'm in the camp where I feel vernacular schools shouldn't exist. Mm. Although my wife thinks otherwise, you know? <laughs> my wife thinks otherwise as well. <laughs> and they're like, you better yeah. see the Chinese okay. school. But like, <laughs> I, mean, I think very differently. Yeah. So let me, let me wear my policymaker hat. Nah. Let's uh. talk. When we start only associating blame to one schooling system, like vernacular school, yeah. and we say we need to abolish it, it opens up the floodgates to other abolition of different school systems. For example, where it's about religious schools, mm -hmm. tafis, yep. international, private, and many others. Right. Yeah. So what's the difference between vernacular and the other systems of education? If you want to have a national system and only one streamlined education system, then you must also consider the, the other, other parts. That's, that's right. true. So yes. that's one. Good, good, good. Secondarily, <clears throat> I'm all for national schools. I'm a product of national schools. However, I think the policy of coercing and forcing without improving does no justice to the system. I we see. have to actually ask a critical question. Why are parents today, not just Chinese and Indians, huh? mm -hmm. I think you know the data where vernacular schools today are actually becoming more and more multiracial. Yeah. Yep. But above and beyond that, even middle-class Malay parents are, sending. are spending a quarter of their, of salary. their salary per, uh, per month to send their children to private international schools. Yes. You mentioned that I mean, in the previous one as well. That is yeah. a, that's a very big concern, yeah. right? I mean, it shows that there's a lack of faith. There's no confidence in the existing system. Right. Yeah. So that's where I feel very passionate about overhauling our public education system. Instead of taking out all the options and competition, we should actually be improving it so that it's so good that parents want to send. So the that's vision or the ideal education system which I have in mind, one is decentralization, give a little bit more flexibility and powers to state. Sarawak, uh, for an example, it's not just legalized UEC, but above and beyond that, now we'll be experimenting on English schools as well. Wow. The point is, as you have other systems, you can collect the data and in a few years' time can assess compare. what's good in this, in, in this system, what's bad. And then from sure. there onward, apply it statewide. So decentralization, to me, leads to better data collection, better experimentation, better decision making. That's true. So I, I show think, another example yeah. of, what, of what decentralization can do. Remember during times of COVID, yeah. Yeah. right? Whenever federal government says all schools are closed, all schools are closed, yeah. right? In a decentralized system, if you are in, let's say, you are in uh, Ranau Sabah, and that's a green zone, yeah. right? And the majority of students there do not have access to internet and also they online education. Gone. So when you, without decentralized education, they have to all close down as well, and they will be disconnected from education for one or two years while someone in KL, yeah, while schools online. are closed, can go for online education. So decentralized education matters, right? And, and to me, this is something which is very really important. One, decentralized education. Second, secondarily, I also feel very passionately about ensuring that our curriculum is truly market ready and we need to make mm. tough calls, tough calls, right? Especially from the school level on what's important and what's not and where we can make it optional and what should be mandated. I give a very simple example. My ideal uh, high school graduate is someone who's a critical thinker, trilingual in terms of uh, language. language expertise and above and beyond that, have very good values. Yeah. Right? So moving in, one is I think it's not, it's not just about being bilingual, it's being trilingual. I think when you do that, that's where you see a lot more people wanting to go to national schools. Above and beyond that, being a member of a select committee in parliament dealing with education, I like to suggest for that select committee to also look at the auditing of the school curriculum. Because let's be very frank and honest, right? Mm. Why aren't Chinese and Indian parents, hey, now even Indian schools, I'm okay. not sure if you know, huh? a lot of Indian schools are closing down. Yes, oh, they are closing Ooh. down. A lot of Tamil schools are closing down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Tamil, sorry. Tamil, no, Tamil no, school. Not enough people yeah. are going. Exactly. Right, so it, it, it is an issue. At the same time, there's an there's a exodus from national schools as well. Right, and that's where people think, oh, now it's becoming more and more monoethnic. So we need to ask ourselves these serious questions. And how do we get them on board? But it must be done via a bipartisan system. Why I say via a bipartisan system? I can be a reformist in education. But if 10 years down the road, government changes and the next government- yep. It will change. It will change. So that's why I think yeah. it must be done via a select committee. A select committee is internal, bipartisan, not much of populism will go straight to the data. 
I think it can be done because again, I even when I meet with the past MPs, the Satu MPs, mm-hmm. when I see where they send your children to, I realize, yeah, they actually send your children to private international schools yeah. as well. Some send abroad, I'm no sense abroad. And then they start to realize, hey, actually if you take away all the noise, they know that yes. there must be an overhaul, yep. right? So yep. I think that's the uh, second. Third, uh, we also feel very passionate about, this is where we go a little bit more into higher education. I think we need to transition from a pure race-based assessment system to one which is needs-based and merit-based. This sounds controversial. However, mm-hmm. I want to say this clearly. A needs-based and merit-based system assists everyone who is underprivileged regardless of race and religion. So if there are more Malays who are underprivileged, yes. Yeah. But my case is very simple. Why must we give priority, let's say, whether it's on scholarships, etc., yeah. to rich Malay kids yeah. and depriving the opportunity of a poor Indian or Chinese kid? Right? It is that simple. Or poor Malay kid for that for the matter Correct. as well. Yeah. yeah. Poor, poor, poor Malay kids <coughs> as well. So a niche-based system is not pure merit like, oh, you come, you, you come from a super rich family, you can go to tuition, right? You can yeah. get all this. And then you get 10 A's and then obviously someone who comes from poor family. You they know, don't have tuition. Right? Yeah. They and then get, get seven A's or that, that person will be kicked out. No, no, no. It looks at your socioeconomic background as well. But race alone should not be the ultimate consideration. For example, you know, I, I remember when, when I'm, I was having this discussion, not people actually don't know the data points behind it. We said, no, no, current system is already merit-based, you know? It's not based on race. Merit, demerit, is it? I'm like, <laughs> hey guys, do you know that, for example, for Asasi Foundation, it's almost 100% hmm. carved out only for one. When it comes to mat- um, matriculacy, it's 90-10. And some will say, oh my God, Sadiq, you're going against the constitution. I'm not. This is a policy issue. Because previously, the, the percentage has changed, right? Right, right, right. From 60-40 to 90-10. So it's not a constitutional issue. It is a policy issue. My case as a policymaker, I want to make it better for all Malaysians and to assist the underprivileged so that they get equal access or equal opportunities, not equal outcomes. Because I be firmly believe that if you give a chance to a Malay kid, right, who comes from an underprivileged family, you give him a chance, he will not need crutches for the rest of his life. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Because in the end, yeah. he can prove himself. I do not believe when people say, that just because I come from a specific skin color, from a specific religion, immediately I'm, I'm forever as, yeah. underprivileged, that I'm forever weakened, that I'm lazy, that I'm incapable, and that I cannot compete on my own merits. That is not true. If anything, that weakens my community more. It creates a negative perception and it tattoos the perception that I'm forever incompetent and weak and I'll forever be crutches. No. I think we are resilient. When we're put to the pressure cooker, we become better individuals who will make Malaysia a great country for all. Definitely, definitely. But I, I mean, I'm going to echo what Andrew said before this podcast. Like, he did say something about how it's this weird dance right now. So if let's say you're in government, right? And yeah. I know you're talking about policy change, so it has to change by policy. Yeah. But if let's say like the government needs to have, let's say, Bumi Putra rights, it needs to have all that to get the votes, right? How long and what is the, the, okay. the ratio? That's, a, that's right? a fair point. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think, I think uh, from from any party standpoint, you want to win. Yeah. Yeah. You want to alter policy, yeah. make the country a better place. To win, you need votes. To get votes, you need to appease the people. Yeah. Which is the majority. Right. So yeah. if the, ma- I'm, I'm going to be quite straight up here, right? Please do. So if the majority are Malays, they currently have a policy advantage, so to speak, mm. right? 90-10, I benefit, I, I benefit from this trait. Yeah. Now you're telling me, equal playing field for all, meritocracy is the way. While I am not a fool, I understand that that's probably morally the right thing to do. That serves to commercially harm me. Okay. Therefore, mm-hmm. you are not entitled to my vote. That's a fair point. How okay. do we address, like, I, I, I agree with your policy personally, but I don't think that's going to win votes. Okay. So how do we balance the two? So this is the problem, as I shared at the beginning yeah. of our podcast, that when there is a lack of a vision, there is a vacuum. And that vacuum immediately gets filled with divisive issues of race and religion. Practicing the politics of pandering and a lack of a vision actually divides Malaysia even more. Where you try to appease one side so much by pandering, you will actually lose support from both sides. And in the end, you pull Malaysia away from the middle. And in the end, we all suffer. So allow me to make my case. First thing first, I'm not here to advocate for complete removal. I'm realistic. Mm. And that's why I always follow data points. When I talk about policy changes, I'm in line with the federal constitution. I show a very simple example. Why do I advocate for an overhaul of the NEP? 
Mm. I advocate that because after decades of implementation, <clears throat> equity among Malays have not actually increased to a level in which it targets, which is 30%. It, there has been an increase, undeniably, <clears throat> from 2.7%, now we're about 13 to 15%. You take away the GLCs, it becomes even lower, by the way. <laughs> so the point of the matter is, it's not a race issue, it is a policy issue. After decades of the same policy, which is meant to alleviate poverty among the Bumi Putras, a quarter of Bumis in Sabah still live below poverty line. I'm not even talking about middle class, below poverty line. Again, it shows a systemic policy problem. But to compound to that, when there are policy problems and you insist on remaining status quo while creating the misperception towards the private sector, towards all races and religions in Malaysia by saying that we will forever need crutches, that when we succeed, it is because of our race and our quotas, it actually weakens and takes away the hard work, diligence, the innovative minds of Malay leaders, entrepreneurs who actually made it on their own. And that misperception, I think, hurts the community even more. So what am I advocating for? I'm advocating for a data-driven decision-making process. So obviously, for example, will Syed Sadiq abolish Mara? No. But does that mean, for example, that other funds should be created to ensure that every single Chinese and Indian kid who performs decently in his or her academic uh, uh, education and come from an underprivileged background should also get access to a scholarship 110% yes, right? So the point is, you don't have to make radical changes immediately. I mean, if I'm sorry, sorry I come, I say, I'm going to abolish the, uh, what, this, the, this provisions in the constitution. I mean, I mean first I'll Chaos go to up. jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But secondarily, <laughs> even as a policymaker, I'm, thinking I'm, being, I'm being very dishonest to myself because opening it up completely without it being data-driven is actually very dishonest as well. Why? I give a very specific example. Data has also shown that the Indian community in particular suffers from intergenerational poverty, the most, the most, right? So there must also be, no, no, there must also be specific policies to assist. I mean, I'm not, I'm not living in a, in a, what is it? In a, a singing kumbaya or in a utopia thinking, oh, Malaysia, Malaysia will never care about race and religion. Yeah. No, no, that's why I'm saying it's a merger, but it cannot just be about race. That should not be the only determinant. That's why I say a needs space which assess everything. Your socioeconomic level, where you stay, whether you're in Wilayah Sabah or Sarawak, Pedalam, this should all be factored in. And that data points then direct to genuine good policy making. So I give one simple example. Um, so a 19 year old lady, Chinese lady recently who didn't come from a privileged background, got into Harvard University. I saw that post, yeah. But did not get into our pre. What does that tell you? We didn't get into our own pre our, Correct, yeah. into our own pre -u. Got into Harvard University, bro. Got them. And got into like two or three different Ivy League. Wow. Okay. I mean, if that doesn't signal a breakdown of our system, I do not know. That, what is, else. So that is such a waste of okay. talent. I want to ask, so ask all Malaysians, including Malays, who misses out when she leaves Malaysia, she vote works. with her feet, pack up her bags, leave, study there, get a job there, smartest and brightest, and in the end, pay taxes there, we builds lose up the infrastructure, the technology, the SMEs there. We lose out regardless of race and religion. And that's why I keep on sending this point that Malaysians must see themselves and their lives and their future as a shared dream. That our lives and fate are interconnected with one another. When we succeed, we succeed together. When we fail, we fail together. Because this is not like the 1900s, you know, where, for example, people can say, Allah, you can, you know, when the Chinese fails, uh, when, when, when this country goes to, 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 to the dogs or when there's war, they'll go back to China. Oh, India will fail, go back to India. Hey, these are third, fourth, fifth generation today. They, they don't know anyone in China and yeah, India. Bro, yeah, I, mean, I don't. Exactly. I, we yeah, were I mean, in China, we know. There you go. We, I, I, be, I am like, oh my God, I miss KL so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bro, this is Tana okay. Tumpa Daraku, bro. Exactly. Yeah, man. Literally yeah, man. song right there. Yeah, so yeah. the past is the past. I'm not saying that we should forget our history. But do not allow history to impede our ability to move forward as a country. So I'm advocating for a system which gradually shifts in that direction, driven by good policy making, and ensuring that the underprivileged, regardless of race and religion, while acknowledging that a lot of them are Malays, will be assisted, but not through one-off handouts, not Good assisted, data. you know, just by following all policy making which have been proven to fail, but structurally to ensure that they have 
access to equal opportunities. I believe doing that will help my community a lot more than the old power structures which hurt us. Actually, I think he's right. Like you see, for example, right, Malaysians, right, when shit hit the fence, ah, we all come united. Yeah. Like for example, you see what, the Joe, like, Joina Choi stuff. <laughs> not Joina Choi, but like, <laughs> Joe Shilin, Joe Shilin, 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 You see yeah. the entire comment, all the Malays, Chinese, Indians, they just coming together <sighs> and they bash her. Yeah. You know, but then there's another level of unity, la. That's yeah, yeah. The unity is there. <laughs> you know, it's just that we are not seeing it. Like what he said in the teams, in the point of needs, we are going through race first, and that's what that's the. Thing. I don't know who yeah. told me this, but I think someone what? told me that hate unites people. Hate unites people. Hate unites pain people la, more than la. love. I think it's know. from Naruto la, pain or something. No, 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 no. It's <laughs> right? hate. No. It's like hate unites people more than love. That type of thing. That's it's probably like a true, actually. Isn't that black eyed peas? But at the same love. time, on the flip side, when we see Dato Lee Chong Wei or many other of oh, that's true. Athletes, it unites yeah. us as well. Total unity. So does. instead of, I mean, obviously there's a little bit of negativity uniting people, but let's focus a lot more on the positive. <laughs> 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 right, right. No, I, I want to talk a little bit more about education, right? Yeah. Okay, but um, so we parents, I think parents, they always focus in the your child's grade, yeah, grades and everything, right? But I noticed that we should that is is Moda gonna put any priority in the just money side of education or like like exercise, like PJK, like oh. in statistics right now, like one out of twenty Malaysians out there adults obese, yeah, yeah. So that's like we are the America, it's twenty percent, so one in five, one yeah. of five. Oh my lord, okay. Yeah. And then I'm seeing kids nowadays Michelin, yeah, Michelin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this guy, yeah. <laughs> this guy is not gonna get cancer, bro. He just called the fake people Michelin, bro. Okay. I'm Jesus. seeing kids, you know, and stuff like that. So, and then when in school, right, you only get one, one, one lessons of PJK. Yep. A week. Which is a week. If I'm not mistaken, that was how we were raised up. So you get one hour. First time needs to tuka baju. So you have 15 more minutes left. Correct. Correct. After that, you must go to the padang. That's five minutes. Then teacher will come late, so that's another five minutes. Then 20 minutes out of the thing. Then warm up, you get 30 minutes. And then team selection, you get five minutes, so you left 25 minutes. But you need to finish your PJK in 15 clothes, minutes. Yeah. Then you change clothes back and go to your next class. So technically, you got 15 minutes to warm up and then you're going back class. And I and because of that, right, I do believe that people, sort of Malaysians, we are not understanding the technique and the just minds of education. Yeah. And that's why we do have quite a number of obese, even a technique. Like for instance, even for all of us, the only time we, we are very well versed in... <coughs> in gym or in yeah. I, I think health, in health in general was in college simply because we couldn't get the girls. 100% we totally want to get the girls. We want to get the girls. Either that or you want to go like, bro, big chest, bro. Correct. <laughs> is it like two tap? You, you know, it's either you chat or you're unseen, you know? <laughs> it it, it, it's true, you know? He's speaking from the heart. I'm Clearly. speaking from the heart. Why did I go gym? <laughs> no girl saw me, you know? You I'm married already, bro. Like yourself. I'm married, <laughs> you know? But I your think chat, or, <laughs> there is a slight neglecting of PJK, which I feel is very important. If we were to taught them since young, you know, when you when you have greater physique, yeah. students will be able to capable to study better. Yeah. They are more focused. Yeah. You know, it really helps as well. Yeah. Is, is there, is, will Muda do anything in terms of this? I mean, I believe in overhauling our education system in and out by acknowledging that today it is broken. I want to start by acknowledging mm -hmm. that because no parties want to admit that the system is broken. Is broken. Okay. This guy is like Donald Trump. How does it link to... <laughs> Oh my God, please don't let Donald Trump. <laughs> no, I, I, like, I, like, I, I recently saw a clip. Uh, he, uh, Dave Chappelle was talking about Donald Trump. So what Donald Trump said, he said, the tax system is rigged. You know? <laughs> and then, uh, he's, and then Don, uh, Obama and uh, Clinton said, no, it's not. And then Trump, Trump said, yes, it is because I use it. Ooh. You know, I'm and saying. It's hard to say no, right? That yeah, is, experience. You know, it's hard to say that. He's like, I use it. And then he's like, whoa, you know? <laughs> and then, then, uh, um, then uh, Hillary Clinton said, Hey, don't pay tax. Then he's like, I don't pay tax because I'm smart. <laughs> but I will pay tax if you change your policy, but you won't change because you and your donors are currently enjoying the same benefits I do. Then I'm like, that guy is a god. <laughs> either, either way, saying someone sounds like Trump is not a compliment. So. Guys, <laughs> guys, let's, let's just- Now we know, we know, we know the, if, if he were in the States, he'll definitely- Maybe not like Trump, but what he's trying to say is no one is trying is daring yeah. to say what they don't yeah. they want to say, but yeah. he's trying to say that there needs an overhaul, you know? Yeah. I see okay. that vision. Like. So back to the point, <laughs> the education system is broken. Okay. And the overhaul, it's mm. not just about syllabus. It's not just about entrance, uh, exams <clears throat> and getting to universities. But when we start at primary and secondary education, besides syllabuses, we also agree that in order to get a good quality education, it means that you need to have good values and values which you carry from young to when you are old. Being fit, mentally and physically fit, is mm -hmm. one. Trilingual, 
is another. Confidence to speak. Having that innovative, critical thinking mindset. These are all tied in together. So when you talk about PJK, it's not just about the PJK. If you go to a lot of national schools today, look at the food which they're serving in Oh, it's horrible. Woo! Okay, horrible. Just, just, My goodness. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a byproduct of the system. I know all, all of us are, like, man. Right? And I always visit schools all the time. Mm. And um, I think that's one area in which we truly need to change because of the fact of the matter, you can go play a lot of sports, but if your diet nutrition is, and diet is worse, it's bad, it, it, that, that will not move the needle enough. That's mm-hmm. one. Two, when you look at PJK, until today, even then when I was in school and I experienced the same thing, you, you depicted it very well. <laughs> but above and that usually what will happen, even though there's actually now there's a whole curriculum on what you should do for Pernikahan Just Money. But I vividly remember when it was my time, people didn't open the textbook. They just, guys, I throw you balls, like footballs. <laughs> yeah, bro. And then ladies, Let's go and play. it's like Sounds bola, about jaring, bola, bola, jaring, uh, bola jaring or bola tampa. Yeah. And then- when No done, supervision. That's it. Right? So in yeah. actuality, it must be structured. It must teach you good diet. It must teach you different sports so that then you can experiment yeah. on what- Know what you like. Correct, on what you like. Because you may not like football. Yeah. Right? So you, you, you need to experiment and it's above and beyond it, you need to really reskill and upskill. Mm. Uh, our teachers, I don't blame our teachers because sadly enough, our teachers today are overburdened and are overworked. And that's not me saying, the data are saying it. They're expected to be, they're expected to do everything, right? They're expected to be a clerk teacher, informing a math teacher, move to a Spadirkan Jasmani, studying from Pernikahan Jasmani, no being moved to Yeah, no specialization. Science. And then, while all that is happening, adding so much clerical work on them. So obviously, they won't have time to do all of this, right? Correct, correct. So, really, I think it's a combination of overhauling our education system. You go to a private international school, everything is very structured, teacher supervision, allow experimentation in the sports which you do, you get really good access to good quality, healthy food. Yes, it is expensive, but I just want to point this out. In Malaysia, we are already heavily subsidizing our public education. No kidding. We subsidize uh, sorry, 21% of our GDP per capita is spent on education alone. Oh, wow. Allow me to give you context of how big that is. Singapore spends 11 to 13%. Per no Per capita. But Japan <sighs> spends. 11%. Poof. India oh. spends 3%. Goes low. Malaysia spends per capita 21%. Yet, defi- despite overspend, per capita, not G, despite overspend, yeah, despite spending so much more than the other countries, our output, a Singaporean 15 year old is three years ahead in terms of understanding. I was understanding, just going to say that they're ahead. Uh, than a Malaysian student. And above and beyond that, Malaysia suffers from chronic underemployment, which means that despite our graduates having good degrees or masters- Gig economy. Where in the gig economy, you don't practice what we've learned for the past six years and we have huge student debt behind us. So it shows it's not just about money. It is about having the political and moral courage to revamp our education system to ensure that every single dollar you put in, you get $3 back. Instead of putting in a dollar and you only get back 50 cents. So there's a lot more which we need 21%. to change. 21%. Yep, 21%. Where is, 21%. It, where is the 21% going specifically? So if I'm, if I'm giving it to the- There's a lot. I mean, uh, in, in, in many, di- so it's from bottom to tertiary education to TVET. I'll give very, yeah, we spend about 8 billion on TVET. That's actually a big amount. Mm-hmm. We have more than 600, almost 700 TVET colleges across Malaysia. Yet, the TVET occupancy is below 50%. And then they incentivize them mad on. They will give you like, oh, free scholarship or whatever. No, it's right? it, 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 You enter free. It's free yeah. education already. You get monthly allowance some more. Ooh, to study. You. Yeah, you get, wow. yeah, you get paid to study. And when you graduate, your employability level is 97, 98%, bro. But in Malaysia, again, we love to spend so much money building new institutions. I think in parliament, every single session, you'll see an MP standing up. Please build a TVET college in my Kawasan. Build 50 million ringgit contract. Three years to talk because no students. Mm. You mentioned I mean, can you look the, at the number yeah. of Yat Mara which have closed down? I mean, so many. It is, the, the take up rate is so low and that's why I've proposed, you know, now we have a UPU intake. Everyone got all and ev- after every UPU, everyone oh, this this is not fair. I didn't get it. Do we have a parallel UPU for TVET? Despite the fact we have 600 TVET colleges, make it competitive, privatize where possible. 
so that you get good quality, confirmed salary after shorten the time I got TVET in Malaysia. You go to school, technical or vocational, form four, form five, that's mm-hmm. two years. You don't even get a diploma. Huh. You get a certificate. Oh. After that, to get a diploma, you need to study another three years. So much time. Five years. In Germany, uh, you start when you are 15. After two years, you get a diploma. When you go to tertiary education, TVET is about specialization. If you want to be, let's say, general TVET, you take photography. When you enter university, some people enter university, you take micro-credential, six months become a professional wildlife photographer. So you specialize. After that, that means you are four or five years ahead instead of your, your friend to go to university. You have already a general diploma in TVET. And both or beyond that, you have a specialized micro-credential in the field which you want. Your starting salary is 3,500 ringgit. Damn. That's a good starting salary. You should be doing that. In Malaysia, oh, no, 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 no. TVET, five years as well. Hey, five years better you go to university lah. Yeah, man, right? same thing. So, I'm bet- again, every time, this, there's a lack of ideas of political will because it will always be about let's build new. Right? Contracts there, contracts there. Nice lah, right? <laughs> you spend a lot. So the money is not going effectively. Yeah, just- you know, I met up with TVET lecturers today. Uh, okay. My kawasan. Uh, they're telling me mm. they're not just expected to teach now because the take-up rate of TVET in your college is so low. No, they have additional KPI to recruit students. Oh, wow. they have sales KPI. They are sales, sales people. Yeah, they are salesmen. You know how sad it is? These are lecturers, cool. professionals who are tasked to teach now, they must also be salesmen. That's quite mad, bro. So they can earn an income. I mean, <laughs> that's quite mad. La. That does not show that the system is broken. I don't know what else shows. So, that's quite again, mad. the conclusion is acknowledge the system is broken, have the political and moral will to overhaul change and account with good policy making. Question, Said. So, I, I believe your stance is Muda's stance, yep. right? Overhaul the system, especially in the, in the context of education. Yep. What are all the other parties doing? Do they not agree that the system needs to be overhauled? Ooh. <laughs> Before you answer that question, okay, I just want to make a swap with MJ because I feel that MJ has a lot of questions to ask as well. Okay? And <laughs> every time I have a conversation with MJ, I, I know he's got so many questions to ask, so I just want him to come in. But you hold that question you just swap with me. Andrew just asked that question. Okay? okay. So I want you to hold that thought. Whether the parties all agree. I heard that question also. But I'm sure you got something to add to it. Okay? I'm just going to throw it. This guy, he's a walking dictionary. Okay. And he's, he's got a great comprehension yeah. of Malaysian like history as well. So Zhuge I think, Liang yeah. level, you know? Zhuge Liang. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Zhuge Liang. Yeah. This is... Yamcha session featuring viral right now. <laughs> yes, happy to have you here. FT, no, it's a FT, pleasure. You're the first uh, politician to sit uh, on that seat. Well, I feel very honored. Honest, uh. You can sell this later in Shopee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sell on Shopee, yeah, <laughs> Allah. To that dodo, you know. <laughs> okay, I, I, what was it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so education, it's broken. Overhaul it. That's mm-hmm. Buddha's stance. Yeah. In the context of an election, it is essentially a competition between parties. Correct. Right. Who has the better policy that yeah. speaks to the rugby? Correct. Personally, I agree with your stance, but yeah. that's just me. Yeah. The other population, everyone else is evaluating these policies. Yeah. What are the other parties' stance on education? How do you compare to them? Yeah. I mean, as I shared, these are not rocket science ideas. To be very frank and honest, these are not even my ideas. When I was in government, I had access to expert reports. We spend millions, actually tens of millions. Every time a new administration comes in, we hire the BCG. McKinsey, oh Amandu, boy. name it, all of them. And, and to be fair, they do a great job in coming up with data-driven decision-making solutions. But after every single administration, there's a lack of political will to actually carry it out. So when a new, what's the purpose of spending tens of millions to get the solutions but on about. your table? Ayo, cannot Anala. do la. <laughs> Apa la. So if you notice ah. the same people who have been saying the same things, maybe not as detailed as what I'm saying now, but almost the same thing, like how do we move away from a needs mer- uh, to, to a needs and merits based system? You know, how do we deal with pre U and metric class C? You know, how do we deal with uh, outdated curriculums? But when they're in power in less than three months, they say, no, no, the system is not broken. Status quo is good. You know? And I'm like, because I asked this question in parliament before, and they were like, yeah, they agree. And now they're like, no, like, you're wrong. What is going on? I mean, so to me, I start to realize it's just lack of a political drive and political will because that's just very convenient, right? They just say, no, no, everything's okay. Because they don't feel it. The fact of the matter, they don't feel it. Because they don't send your children and grandchildren there, right? I mean, in the end, they get to enter the, the elite schools. They're creating a, 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 a separation of class among the rich and the elites between the underprivileged and the middle class. And they don't feel it. There's not much skin at stake. 
I think it's it because becomes a problem. Privilege is invisible to those who has it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. so my hope is this, right? I hope there will be a contestation of ideas on these issues. And whether I win or not, I mean, I'm gonna be very frank, right? Moody enters, we're not even contesting like 10%, not even 10%, I think heck, 5%. Right? I mean, we're only contesting 15, 20 seats out of like 240. I mean, we cannot change federal government, we cannot change state government, but we can spark a strong discussion on this issue. Sure, that's fair. And we can push it through so that in the next GE, if they still don't listen, then I think it's time for us to go big. I'm hoping they will listen. For example, when I push to cut the time in university, right? In Malaysia, it takes about six years. In developed countries, about four years. And I push mm -hmm. really hard. I think now there are some attempts to change it. The Minister of Higher Education said, we'll try to cut it by one year, which I think is decent progress. I spoke a lot about paid internships. Now it's being discussed. I spoke about asset declarations. And yes, I criticized very openly about it. And now the Prime Minister said, okay, okay, we will declare. Right? Even though he said that the same thing like six <laughs> months ago in January, yes. it didn't happen. But the point is, at least there's, there's, it's responsive. <laughs> yes. But it just shows that having a voice of conscience and an alternative is very important because to expect, sorry, we get a little bit political. All good. Rikata National to do this, they won't. They won't bring this up. I mean, so, I mean, you need, you need another party who actually cares about policies to bring this up. And I'm hoping that Mudo will be given a chance to do so. So in, in, in your opinion, is Brigata National not a party who cares about education at all? Is that, is that the stance? Name me the education policies which Brigata has been talking about. Can't name you a single one. Exactly. So he says I, I can't name that. as well, to mm. be honest. But I mean, back then I remember they removed PMR, PG3, UPSR. Um, sorry, UPSR actually. Yeah, it was UPSR. It was done, uh, PG3 was earlier. Uh, which I agree. So that part, great, right? But uh, what else? <laughs> I mean, at that point in time, a lot, of a lot of students lost about two years uh, yeah. of education because they, their own ministry data shows that half of them do not even have a laptop, tablet, or smartphone, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't even started about internet access. Oh. That's two years of lost education. They are now the lost generation. They're already three years behind Singapore. Plus two, that's five. <laughs> when you enter university, we graduate two years later, that's seven years. Seven valuable years. I think that's where we need to play catch up, not just catch up. We need to turbocharge our education yeah, system right. forward. Yeah, good. I mean, undeniably, I think we can all say education is very important because the, it is young people who's going to carry out Malaysia later on. Yeah. So hopefully, kalau you menang, hopefully, we're going to see a change, which is great, which is great. But also, we're talking about change, right? Moving on earlier when we were talking about economy and, and yeah. stuff, right? You mentioned about the Joho sector and stuff. I think yeah. this is because we they will have an alliance or whatsoever yeah. with Singapore, right? Yeah, so, like, so I uh, think buddy recently, buddy. Yeah. Uh, mm. um, Rafizi Ramli uh, talked about wanting to introduce this special economic zone between ah. Johor and Singapore. And so this is obviously, this is, your, idea. Your, 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 this is your area. And then yeah. apparently there's going to be some Malaysian Singapore retreat, Malaysian Singapore leaders retreat where they will discuss these issues, right? Um, one of the big issues, uh, one of the big mysteries actually is why is it that being so close to a financial center, Johor is not quite where Shenzhen exactly. is compared to Hong Kong. Uh, Iskandar uh, Forest wow. City was That's obviously- like, Oh my God, he took my argument already. Oh, uh, yeah. you know, Iskandar Forest City, you know, you know, they were wetting Singaporeans' appetite via the next, Shen Johor's the next Shenzhen, right. Right? right? Outside of maybe Pengarang and Legoland. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, I Which always felt Kazana at one point in time considered to sell, but yeah. Yeah, I, I always felt mm -hmm. that there are, there are a few underperforming states in Malaysia. And right. I, I have to be honest, I think Johor and, and Malacca are two. I think, Safe to say, Slango and Penang are up there, but yeah. Malacca and Johor is yeah. What were your thoughts? What, 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 why is it that it's taken so long to create this zone where it's yeah. like so obvious, right? Yeah. I mean, to, to be fair, to be fair to Johor, despite it's not under our administration, mm -hmm. to be fair, they've actually attracted one of the largest FDIs in the past few years. And I have to give credit where credit is due. However, I think when you say lagging behind, despite us being neighbors to Singapore, we yeah. could have like, go all the way up. So for example, you mentioned about the leaders retreat. That's nothing new. I remember every year we have that in Singapore. Yes. Like prime minister to prime minister. Maybe three cabinet. or four years or something. Correct. Like right. yeah. And um, having an um, entertainment, entertainment, economic zone in which we could discuss, deliberate and make joint decisions. To some extent, we also have that as well. To me, it's not just about having it once a year. They must be top level um, uh, management, joint management meeting every month with Singapore. We should not see Singapore as a competitor 
we should be seeing, seeing Singapore as a collaborator. I give a very simple example. Huh? Back then, we did not want to sell renewable energy to Singapore because we were fearful if we sold to Singapore, then our RE independence in Malaysia should be weaker because we will be focusing on exporting to Singapore. Sure. And two, we will lose the comparative advantage and data centers will pick Singapore instead of us. So data centers, one RE, Singapore production of RE is like four or five times more expensive than us. There are thousands of data, com- data center companies in the world. I mean, and they all want to come to join Singapore. Instead of seeing each other <laughs> as competitor, we collaborate. We export renewable energy. They give us technology, tech transfer, capital, good interest loans. And above from your net, we get so much money in ringgit, right? Because they buy yeah, yeah, yeah. so much more. In Malaysia, you sell at about 21 cents per kilowatt hour. You sell to Singapore, you almost get one ringgit per kilowatt hour. Mm-hmm. I mean, we benefit so much. And then we can, we have the economies of scale, we can grow, we can become regional power when it comes to RE. That's what you get when you see them as collaborators, not as competitors, right? That's just on RE and data centers. There are many other areas, right? I mean, people are looking at property. Back then, it's about capital land, working together in Johor to expand Mm. above and beyond that. Now, when Singapore is hosting so much private family offices, prior to COVID, they had only about 50. Now they have close to 600. These are multi-billionaires bringing their assets, money, wealth in Singapore, finding areas of investments. It's okay they pick Singapore, bring their money here. Malaysia, Singapore having that joint, that high joint committee, pick areas, streamline areas of investments, joint investments between countries, redirect welfare. It's a win-win. Singapore today, their politics is suffering from, to some extent, a little bit of xenophobia where now they no longer want to accept people from abroad, smart, talented individuals. Well, it's okay. Malaysia can benefit from it. Instead of Malaysians flying, staying there and cost of living being ridiculously expensive, Ooh. Now get Singaporean companies, not just the big ones, SMEs to hire Malaysians in Malaysia, just pay us 50% more, not even double, 50%. No, um, they, they can even afford to pay us 50% less yes. than what they're paying in Singapore. But yet in Malaysia, we get double the amount. Yeah, market, boy. <laughs> and we get work flexibility. <laughs> work right? from home. Work from home. Our cost of living, our, I mean, uh, uh, a lot more affordable than Singapore and good income. I can, I can name one by one areas of joint investments in which we could work together. But the end goal is this. What, I mean, how do we treat and how do we treat Singapore and how do we see Singapore as a competitor, as an enemy? You know, I see Singapore as a family member, inseparable Ooh. from Malaysia, but while different sovereign countries. Brethren, yeah. Yep. But <laughs> we are family. I mean, effectively, we are family. A lot of Malaysia and Singapore not a in one another. We are family. Right? Yeah. I mean, it is impossible to, 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 to think of a conflict between Malaysia and Singapore without hurting our family members, right? I'm, to some extent, how Singaporean. My father's side was from Singapore. Mm. I mean, I'm the, one of the rare cases where my father was Singaporean became a Malaysian. Quite rare, right? Usually it's the other way around. Unfortunate, sorry. Yeah, uh, I think it's fortunate. <laughs> I defend that decision. Yeah. But, but that's like, I mean, the point is, it is, we are inseparable, right? So yeah. see that relationship as a collaborative relationship, not one which is of pure competition. And I think we can really turbocharge this region's economy for even on entertainment. I mean, you can imagine if we just work with Singapore, our country, both Ministry of Tourism, in Singapore cannot host all concerts. Huh? I mean, I mean, if not, they, they don't have a lot of stadiums. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> we Sorry. have a lot of stadiums. Can mm. you imagine if our concert organizers, federal government, state government works together to pursue all these big concerts? And we are truly multiracial and diverse, whether it's in Mandarin, Tamil, Arab, Malay, Brit English, and then host it here. We have eight, we have a stadium capacity, 85,000, 70,000, 60,000, right? They can't host everything, but we host it together. We pursue it together. So when they come to Southeast Asia, going to Singapore is like going to Malaysia, going to Malaysia is like going to Singapore. Yep. And we share it together. It's okay. I mean, the point is, it's limitless opportunities. And maybe we can bid for a World Cup in the future, right? Exactly. I, I mean, to see that, man, one day. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, uh, yeah. So we can bid for so many things together, <laughs> but that relationship must be inseparable no matter who is in power. And I think that's where it's not us leeching on Singapore, it's us building on each other's strengths and addressing yeah, yeah. each other's weaknesses together. Yeah. And I think people don't realize that Malaysia's ceiling is a lot higher. Yeah. Right. But uh, you know, one, one thing, what I'm hearing from you now is a very free trade, free market oriented 
um, approach to things. Yeah. Which is very interesting to me because I think just a few days or perhaps a week ago, About it was week announced ago. that uh, Muda has decided to work together with PSM. Yeah. Uh, uh, and for those listening who aren't aware, Party Socialist Malaysia, not known to be uh, advocates of uh, free market, market economics. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe walk us through the decision to to work with them sure. as, as, as a political strategy. Uh, mm-hmm. This one is like, to be, you, to be, Sorry, sorry. sorry. I, want, I wanted to just put some Naruto meme, but you just continue. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say, like, I want Uchiha yeah. yeah. and Uchiha and Uchiha and Ashirama. Stop, la, Senju, Senju. Ah, Senju. Okay, stop, sorry, sorry, stop. We can hear, we can Continue. <laughs> to be very frank and honest, there are a lot more commonalities than differences. Even when it comes to dealing with the economy, I mean, we do believe in progressive taxation. We do believe in building a system of equal opportunities, not equal outcomes. We do believe in unionizing workers and labor movements. There's actually a lot of similarities. Obviously, when it comes to trade, I do believe in open trade. But at the same time, I want to ensure that I, I want to ensure that it is fair. Because the last thing which you want is to open up the floodgates and lose whatever competitive edge Malaysia has. And above and beyond that, only benefit one country over the other. If, for example, we open up our markets, but their countries don't, where's the fairness in that? Right? So I think in the end, it's always about finding that middle path and middle ground. Are there differences? Definitely. In any parties and coalitions will be differences. Can we manage it? I think yes. Because in the end, I think everyone will still pick that center, that, that middle path uh, in moving forward. And we want to see more workers' unions. We want to see wages increase. We want to see uh, labor rights being upheld. We want to see a world in which provides equal opportunities and not equal outcomes. So if you look at the five uh, principal points which unite Buddha and PSM on rejecting uh, politic per kauman, on protecting the majority, labor rights and labor movements, I think these are areas of common interest which we share a lot. What, a quick question. What, are some of, or what is one big difference between Muda and PSM? that you had to compromise on to have this collaboration with PSM? I remember that they were, members were saying that there are some policy lines which were just not practical. Some. However, I was sharing, to be honest, even from Muda, there are some ideas which are super unconventional. However, in order to manage a country, we need to prove that we can manage our differences and find a middle path and middle ground. Because managing coalition politics also shows that we can manage um, national politics because it is about compromises and differences. Um, but to be very honest, I think it was very much smooth sailing. Oh, It was right, very smooth. Right. I mean, we, I actually met up with them even before GE. And oh, we wow. were hoping that both of us will be <clears throat> part mm-hmm. of Pakatan Harap. And we both applied. Actually, they applied earlier than us. Oh, yeah. uh, and they got rejected? Uh, yeah, I mean was really said not just rejected, but they were not even allowed to contest anywhere it together. Was. So since you mentioned PH, I think now is a good time to, well, I was perusing through, I think Malaysia's number one complaint center, Twitter Jaya. <laughs> uh, that's a very good way of, uh, it is a place to explain right? yeah. uh, That's why I like, I prefer thread a bit more. It's yeah, a lot yeah, more positive. I'm, I want thread as well now. Yeah, yeah. You're very positive now. Like. Yeah, it's, it's the opposite of Twitter, right? Um, and, and, one of the big criticisms, and I, I think some of your, uh, some of the accounts defended you as well, was this whole discussion on Muda being so idealistic. I think you've mm. recently filled a couple of candidates. I think it's Melanie Ting, right? Yeah. Uh, she's 23. Yeah. Uh, are you the oldest in the party? Uh, no, actually the oldest in the party is a 92-year-old lady. No what? way. Wow. Yeah. No way. I mean, not in leadership, but we actually have quite a number of members who are okay. old, but not wanting to so, be in leadership anyway, roles. Yeah. The, the reason I, I bring this up mm. is because I think it's very, you have made it easy in a way, yeah. of course, unintentionally, for critics to say, well, you guys are just a bunch of uh, idealistic people mm. who have, um, on a relative scale, low political experience. And mm. it's basically, to summarize what they're trying to say, is you know, it's a lot more talk than yeah. this action. Why not trust People experience, in experience yeah. and things like that. And there's this whole mm-hmm. discussion on Twitter. Yeah. I, I want to get your response yeah. to that. I think that's, to be honest, I take that criticism with an open heart. It comes from a good place, right? I mean, yeah. how do you deal with the lack of experience? 
trying. I mean, first thing first is to acknowledge that no, they want undangan negeri and no parliament will be exclusively young. <laughs> but let's look at the data of today. We are actually a very young population. It's about 28, 29 yeah. years old. But the parliament today, the average age is about 55. Almost yeah. majority are 60 year olds and above. Where is yeah. the youth representation? Above and beyond it, when you look at Muda and our candidates, we have a balance. We have people like Ami, who has had like a 10 year work experience in civil society, different works, you know, working on the ground almost daily, a Shevening scholar, you know, graduate from a very good university, balanced, slightly old. And at the same time, you have Melanie, who has been working the ground for the past four years, even while she was completing her law degree, working for different civil society movements, running multiple programs and projects, uh, and fundraising for civil societies, for groups on her own. And I've seen what a young lady like her could do if given a chance. Then it begs me the question, if no one gave me a chance when I was 23, would I be where I'm at today? People always look, oh, I was like, that's you, Sadiq, that's you. People forgot where I started. I was a nobody. When I was given a chance, only then can I climb up. Only then can I prove my worthiness. I was given a chance. Why can't I give people like Melanie a chance? While in reality, I think at her age, she has done so much more than me. So Muda is about giving opportunities. And above and beyond it, I like to say this, right? And it's not just, they are like complete fresh, you know, experience they, they have. But are they political lightweights? Definitely. In terms of service, they have experience. But the final point I like to make is this, right? Let's look at, for example, where Melanie is contesting. Huh? Okay, Antra Bangsa. It's under the Parliament of Ampang. She's not contesting to take over the federal government. Federal government, same coalition. State government, same coalition. Member of Parliament in that area, same coalition. Ahli Majlis, Ahli Majlis actually have a lot more power, same coalition. Ketua Kampung, same coalition. Why is it wrong to give an opportunity to Melanie, a young lady who believes in building a diverse, multiracial Malaysia, more policy forward, someone who's young to be given a chance to act as that voice of conscience and the alternative? Will this change the federal government? No. The government? No. Ahli Parliament? No. No. So why not have the alternative? Or unless you want to have a monopoly and say, this is my entitlement, my party's entitlement, top to bottom, it must all be me. I think when you give someone like Melanie a chance, how I was given a chance, and I'm privileged to be where I'm at today because I was given a chance, I think that's when you realize that investing in people like Melanie is investing in our country's future because we need a lot more young people to go through that baptism of fire, that pressure cooker to future-proof Malaysia. So, I mean, sticking on, on, on Twitter, um, I recently discovered my love of uh, poetry and I have a favorite yes. poet on oh, wow. uh, yeah. uh, Tunem. <laughs> recently, <laughs> I, I'm suddenly a fan of Shakespeare. I was really <laughs> thinking, who is this poet? I also was thinking, who is this? Uh, you, have, you, you, you have to you admit, know, uh, there's a certain, good there's a certain harmony <laughs> in the way he, <laughs> there's a the tune, a melody in the way yeah, he writes. Yes, yes. And he has the numbers, yes. you know. <laughs> yep. uh, Talking about that, I would yeah. about, uh, do you want some kombucha? Uh, no, I'm good, I'm no, good. No, no worry. Really uh, nice. yeah. Kombucha, free ads, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what? <laughs> very subtle, uh, very subtle. subtle huh? You meant to be subtle? No subtle here. Yeah. Okay, back to your. <laughs> what, what do you think of uh, Tun M's? Um, of course, his, his uh, shopping complex. Shopping yeah. complex. Uh, yeah, comment. I, I read the track. And, yeah. and I think it just in general, he's been on a tear. Yeah. Right? Uh, everyone is saying, you know, like just retired. Tear. Yeah. He's, but he's been on a tear, you know, with his, uh, let's call it, point of views. Yeah. Uh, you you were seen as um sort of an aide or someone always beside Tun M. You were always seen as someone camp Tun M, right? Mm. And of course, you've come out publicly to criticize, criticize a little bit. Give us some color about what's yeah. happening. So to me, on this matter, I mean, I, I, I actually read all the- All these, the all three lah. Yeah. Um, how, how can it not? Based on Elon's, <laughs> Elon's algorithm, it, it yeah, will show up in yeah. front of you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of my disagreements are something which I've, I think he knows. Uh, I mentioned to him not just now, even when I was in government, for example, uh, when he's saying that a lot of young Malays um, will suffer, yeah. we lose our country, and that if we do not assist, 
then they will fall through the cracks of the system. I was giving a different viewpoint. I actually shared my own personal experience to Tun. I said, Tun, I, I've actually never met you before. Uh, I've ne- no one in my family is in politics. I come from a lower middle income family. Mother is a teacher, father is a blue collar worker. I went through our national education system, even up to university, a public university, and only then been given the opportunity to be offered by Oxford twice with scholarship and uh, to study in NUS. And when I represented my university in, in Malaysia, when it comes to debating and public speaking, we broke many records, not just in Malaysia and then conquered Asia and then conquered the world. There were no quotas. There were no crutches. We had to compete on our own merits. And mind you, when it comes to language skills, they're better. General knowledge, they started way earlier, right? Uh, I mean, Oxford is the university of philosophers. And, uh, but yet, we beat them. We beat them on our own merits. And the one who also broke my record was another UITM debater. And he also competed on his own merits and did it. So I'm saying that do not see young Malays as those who cannot compete on their own. Do not see us as permanently disadvantaged. If anything, we could prove ourselves. We just need an equal round of opportunities. That's it, not equal outcomes. And I was trying to impress on that because in the end, it is also very personal for me. Because if everyone keeps on telling me every day that I'm weak, I'm lazy, I'm incompetent, I'm more likely to be that. That's yeah. probably true. Yeah. Right? So, and also <clears throat> if, uh, right? or if I don't believe that, others who hear it, my future employers, regardless of race and religion, even those in GLCs, GLICs, private sector, SMEs, MNCs. I mean, when you keep on repeating that narrative, it actually hurts us even more. So that's one big ground of disagreement. And I've said this before, and especially when I decided not to join Pejuang. Obviously, after I was offered, I told him from the beginning, I disagree on playing the politics of pandering anymore. We tried it before. It didn't work. You know, there was a notion then, you need a Malay leader in a Malay party to change the Malay heartland. We've tried it. There's a way in the end, you have to pander, and pandering leads to more division. I said, it's okay. Let's try the politics of changing hearts and minds and investing for the next 20 years. And that's where there's a point of departure on how we view um, the future of a country. And to be honest, I am generasi bangsa Malaysia wawasan 2020. Right? So that's why I remember when he was talking about it, it's like multiracialism is against the constitution. So we did it. I mean, I don't know if you guys memorized the, the ideals of, of wawasan 2020. Uh, no, I probably cast. did when I was a kid. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, yeah. I memorize it. I have to draw this flying cast. Yeah, yeah. We did it. We were yeah, imagining yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> but, but it wasn't the flying cast. It's actually the ideals. And one of the most important ideal is to build a Bangsam Nation. Wawasan Roplo Roplo, the most important ideal is to unite different races and religions to create a Bangsam Nation, which is essentially multiracialism. And that was done in 1992 when I was born. I mean, when we were born. Yeah. Right? So, to me, so, I mean, if you expect me to call him names, like all these, all these curse words, I won't. But I've learned to agree to disagree in a matured way. Yep. And at the same time, sticking to that principle because I think now it's about the future. He, he will have his views, which may come from his generation. Actually, I don't think it's just his generation. Maybe not it's him. <laughs> but okay. I think it's time for us to move forward. And I will tell him, I disagree. You, 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 I mean, putting on my two name add on, uh-huh. this is how I think he will respond. He you will say, Buddha. We, we agree that there are many races around, mm. but there's a lack of assimilation by the non Malays, right? He will okay. cite uh, Thai Chinese people become having Thai names, Chinese people having Indonesian names. Uh, you go to okay. the UK, you go to the US, you know, black people, Latino people speak English, so why not? assimilate in uh, Malaysia. Okay. And we now we give chance that's to fair. the non-Malays to keep their culture, their yeah. language. And that's why we have this division. Because I see it as, as our strength and not as a liability. I see diversity as a strength. That's why to me, it's not just about tolerating diversity, it's about celebrating it. Malaysia uniquely embraces the concept of unity in diversity. We embrace the concept of a salad bowl, not a melting pot. Melting pot that's is about assimilation. A salad mm. bowl is where you can Together, you taste really good. Yes, individually yes. horrid. Yeah, very weird. Yeah, individually horrid. <laughs> Together, <laughs> it's very weird, but that's what makes us strong. I mean, why do we want to adopt 100% of another country 
while in reality, we are strong in our own respective ways. But does that mean because we choose that salad bowl or unity and diversity model, suddenly it means that we need to not care about data-driven policy-making mm. process? We already have the data. We know that diversity is good. At the same time, we can also make it better. So on that part, that's what I was sharing just now about vernacular schools, private international schools. I mean, there's so many different types of schools. Via decentralization, that's where you get proper data points on, 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 on the academic performance, confidence level, trilingualism. I mean, okay, let's say everyone is fluent in Basa and ideally every Malaysian, not ideally, every Malaysian must be fluent in Basa, at least can, uh, uh, conversational. But is only being fluent in Basa sufficient? Uh, sufficient? No, it's not. I mean, you mean any investor, why they pick Malaysia? One of the biggest reasons they say is because Malaysians are bilingual. Minimum, they are bilingual. A lot of them are trilingual, right? So when the West wants to come, even our taxi driver can talk to them, even though it's not perfect English, broken but English. It's good they enough. can speak to them. It's good, huh? Investors from China. No, even Malays can speak in Mandarin. Investors from Korea. Heck, we can, speak, yeah. we can speak this in Korea because we watch Don't Netflix. Friends, can <laughs> yeah, go? Yeah. yeah, I mean, my officer has never been to Korea. But I can speak fluent Korean. I mean, wow. Thank you, Blackbeard. That's, that's a strength. That's a strength. Right? I mean, why do we see that as a liability? That's why, to me, a bare minimum, our education system, not even tertiary, primary education should make our kids trilingual. Right? Basa, English, and then you pick. You want Mandarin, you want Tamil, you want Arab, but minimum trilingual. Three. This one, I completely agree. And talking about this, right, MJ, you, I mentioned you wanted to talk something about English versus the Malay medium, right? Yeah, I think this, uh, would, this would be it. I think one of the reasons that you've managed to, through your, uh, yes, your merit, but also your ability to reject Oxford is the command of the language, right, of English. And one of the big challenges as a practical standpoint, and this is something that even Singapore faces, this is, they are probably more acutely aware of this, is the fact that most uh, people can only master one language. Mm. And I think there's a fear among the uh, Malays or Putras that if you start to put English, naturally, because of the competitive advantages of English, that people will start to push away. And mm. I, I do understand some of their concerns where they see some of their more wealthy uh, T20 Malays the TTDI Malays who uh, <laughs> see Malay as some sort of, um, you know, second class uh, language and, you know, why bother, right? I can speak English. So how would you tackle the, this issue from a policy standpoint, knowing that it's actually really difficult for people to actually master um, even just one, let alone two or three, which is also probably why uh, it's so popular to pass through in Tunam's era, especially the Malay, the BMization of the syllabus. Yep. Actually, previously in the Tunam's time, <clears throat> he increased the exposure of English in schools, not just the contact hours for about two hours a week. Okay. And previously one hour. Above and beyond that, it's PPSMI, maths and science in English. And if you remember, it became very yeah. controversial. The Malay party doing that. Yeah. <clears throat> and after that being reversed, yes, yeah. yep. which I thought was a bad policy making. But put that aside, it's done. That's why I say in the end, we need to pass big policies like this in select committees so that there's bipartisan interest yes, that even yes. the government changes, it continues. But moving forward, I believe that if you start young, not just in schools, but that also means uh, unique support structures, preschool, right? and exposing our young ones through trilingual Malaysia, they can be fluent in all three. And again, it is about teaching upskilling and reskilling. It is about the amount of time and contact hours we teach them when they're young, when, they are, when their minds are still sponges, not when it is already too late. And as long as it can be conversational in all three languages and still seeing Basa, Malaysia as the uniting point, I think we will be okay. If you look at the TTDI Malays, to be honest, they may not be hyper-fluent, but they can still speak Malay. Yeah. When they go back home, they still speak Malay. When they meet up with their parents, they can also speak in Malay. But they added, why are they the TTDI Malays? Because when they can, 
I mean, it's not a CTD. I feel bad for the. <laughs> 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 no, bro. No, but why do they have an a comparative advantage? Because they are trilingual, right? I mean, studies have shown the employers will look for employees who are bilingual or trilingual. And that if you can speak fluent English and can write in fluent English, on average, your income will increase by five to 600 ringgit a month. That is a lot if you look per annum, what more if you spend it out in 10 mm. to 20 years. Mm. So in actuality, it makes complete economic sense for us to be a trilingual society. It is a strength. It is not a liability. And just because there are some who may not be perfect in Bahasa, it is not an excuse to stop our country's potential from being trilingual and earning so much more by being trilingual. So I, I, I have one last question that is very, very important, probably the most important question, but I like to ask the rest whether you have questions first. You know which question I'm talking no, about. No, you ask your most important question. No, I, I, got, no, a, wait, I no. got a mo- more important oh, really? question. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this one should be <laughs> left to the end. So you know what I'm You ask yours. Yeah, you I ask think you. Uh, we understand that we don't really have much time. You yes, have other yes. pertaining things to do later on, right? So, so far, we have talked through everything, right? And yeah. it kind of feel that like everything stems back to education. Yeah. Like if we were to re how education, right? Um, maybe the social range will be help. Yeah. Economy will be help. And economy help. I think if you, even if you ask questions about wages, why yeah. our currency are low and everything. In the end, I believe if we solve education and then if the worker, the, the students who are studying abroad are actually studying here, it will help our currency and our wages because that's where you get investors coming into Malaysia right. and it fixes a lot of problems. Correct. So education has, has to be one of the top priority that needs to be looked and fixed. Absolutely. Correct. So, please do something about that. All right. I'll do okay. my very best. So, I want to ask about Muda, right? Okay. okay. As a party, right? I just want to ask some stuff about it, right? How, how can a regular Malaysian citizen who is very passionate about changing the country, how can they join the party? I mean, one, go online. Okay. Like muda.my. Muda.my. And join. And join. Two is, my recommendation is to join as many of our volunteering programs. You know, people make fun of Buddha saying, mm-hmm. you're like an NGO just doing welfare work. <laughs> I wear that with a badge of pride. What are they expecting if not I welfare, mean, right? Yeah, because <laughs> we're not, I mean, we, we don't have a lot of MPs and adults. What do you want us to do? Uh, I mean, we do talk about policies a lot, but yeah, like, there's only one state rep and one federal rep. Uh, but by joining our activities, you'll start, and this is where I really feel at home. And, and when I see this, I feel at home. I feel very proud. Even though if we lose for the next 10 years, I feel very proud. Because in every meeting I go, not just at Muda federal level, state level, parliament, small programs, you will truly see the colors of Malaysia. A truly young, dynamic, multiracial, at times even gender balanced team moving together. And whenever I look at it, I remember even, even in other parties which claim that they are multiracial, Actually, it's not. I mean, I, I don't want to mention names, but when I see Muda top to bottom, I start to realize, oh my God, this is... And that's why I feel really proud. Even though it may be tough, right? Maybe Malaysia today may not accept us. It is okay. It is an investment for 20 years to come. So join our team. Be part of that family. Join as many volunteering programs or maybe also partake in the state elections as a volunteer. Um, but in the end, I hope that we share the same dream. You may not join the programs. You may not even join Muda. But as long as we work together to reach that dream 10, 20 years from now to really build Malaysia as a full-fledged developed country with strong institutions which can future-proof our country regardless of partisanship and personalities. A country which truly celebrates diversity instead of merely tolerating it. I think we will be a great country. A country which is tanah hai kita, tanah tumpahnya darahku, and a country which we will consider our home together and forever. You got any Let's questions? Go Please go ahead. So this question is uh, more polarizing than the three R's. Oof. Okay. How do you rate uh, Man United's chances next season? But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> more sen- Actually, yeah, it's more sensitive. It's more polarizing. Yes. Huh? Yeah. I think the, to show how polarizing it is, uh, I think the dispute between 
Man U fans and Liverpool fans when we were trash 7-0. <laughs> Oof. Oof. Lasted Please. much longer, right? I mean, it lasted for like only one month than like all the political conflicts of today. After like <laughs> one week, it'll be- <laughs> That's the only trophy, trophy last yeah. season though. Yeah, yeah, just, that's true. Yeah, right? I mean, seven the, up, right? the, the lack of trophies like, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and also not being top four. I mean, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I've been I've been taking it for too long. Okay. Mm. Yes. <laughs> mm. I mean, obviously, as a fan, I have to say it will be triumphant in EPL. But um, I think the amount of investment City and Liverpool are putting in younger squad, I get slightly worried. Okay. Even though I think, uh, should I be a fan or should I be realistic? <laughs> Really? Okay, what, do you, what do you think of the new signings, I guess? Uh, Ohana and uh, mm. yeah, 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 yeah. Ohana. <laughs> we took Chelsea's uh, Wonder Kid. Correct. And we took the uh, midfielder, Onana, who is the keeper. You, know, you see, Manu has had a track record of taking Wonders in and then, okay, back yeah. then, I mean, to be to very frank, I mean, I still consider, or then, consider Cristiano Ronaldo a Wonder Kid, right? Mm. Yes, um, yes. And when he joined again and then look what happened. So in the end, to be honest, one thing I like about the management today is a lot more systematic. It's not just about relying on one hit wonders. Stars. Right? Yeah. I mean, if not, uh, Renault will still be there and we saw the friction, we saw the interview and we saw the falling out after. So I think it's all about the team. I think if, okay, to put it simply, if the first five matches we do well, I think we'll win. We'll win. We shall see. Yeah. Wow, I cannot wait for the new season already. All right, here, always yeah. data driven. I like you it. You heard it here first. <laughs> you heard it here first. Okay. okay. Yeah, nah. Close All right. It, yeah. Well, uh, so it was so great to have you here. It's good uh, to be back. Oh, I really wait. enjoy talking to you guys. Cannot yeah. wait to do the next time at this in Ota Ota yeah, yeah. and Moa. Yeah? Mm. Could be the beach. Yeah. Could be a durian power. pondo. Provided yeah. there's power. power. I'll, I'll find the power. There's power. We I'll find it. We will bring the generators or whatsoever, <laughs> okay? So before we end our, the, it's a shame that we didn't have, we can't have more time because I mm. think we do have a lot to talk about. Yeah. You guys can watch him on Instagram. He talks a lot about this and everything. Live two days, two days at once, confirm live one. I'm telling you, 100%, you know? Uh, you, will, you, you will see him there. But any last final words to the viewers who are watching this, what do you have to say to them before we end it today? I mean, my... My final point is this, I mean, no matter who we are, where we are from, which religion or race we were born into, I hope we still share the same destination. The paths taken may be different. That's why, I mean, I do believe in matured politics. I do believe in bipartisanship. Uh, you may support different parties. You may have different ideals and values, but I mm. hope the destination is the same, which is to build a truly resilient, multiracial, diverse Malaysia in which everyone feels at home and to become a developed country in Malaysia in which our institutions stand supreme over personalities and hyper-partisanship. And that's why it ties back to one common logic. That even if one day we get the worst version of a Malaysian as a prime minister, our country will still keep on moving forward because our civil societies, our population, our systems of checks and balances are so strong and resilient that we'll keep on marching forward. I hope that we will reach that dream together. A developed Malaysia in which becomes the economic engine of growth of Southeast Asia, the bastion of hope of the Muslim world being a Muslim majority country, yet very diverse, multiracial, moderate, economically progressive. I mean, really a success story uh, for the region. I really think that's not far away. It will happen during our time. It's just a matter of time. Very nice. A country full of growth and potential. Well, you guys heard him. Uh, tight. Thank you so much for being here. Cannot wait to see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys.